Kia ora and welcome to this week's episode of The Niche Cast, where we just spin a big old kōrero about some Aotearoa sporting topics. We are from The Niche Cache, theniche-cache.com, and we like to write and talk and ponder about Aotearoa sport and get deep in the mangroves. That's what we do every day. And there are big Aotearoa sporting yarns on our website, the niche-case.com. The wild card has uh, done a big deep dive, deep in the mangroves, into Chris Wood and his stature, his standing at Newcastle United in the Premier League. I've done a White Ferns little update in the Commonwealth Games tomorrow. I'll check in with the Black Sticks. They are playing overnight. Uh, both teams are playing overnight, so there'll be a Black Six yarn tomorrow. Kiwi NRL spotlights are on the debutants. Dean Mariner, Alfred Smalley, Flying Kiwis is live. Everything you need about Aotearoa sport that you're not finding elsewhere is on our website, theniche-case.com. So check that out uh, as often as your intuition guides you to. That's all good. And big up to our Patreon whanau, patreon.com forward slash our niche case. Shout out to our uh, fresh Patreons. We've got Rog White and we've got Matt Anderson and also the bro Morgan Allen, always busy on the Patreon as well. So shout out to those Patreon Fano members and everyone else who has been a member of the Patreon Fano. Short time, long time, however it is, it's all good. We appreciate your support and your generosity uh, in keeping our Aotearoa con sporting content flowing. As always, there's an extra podcast there, diving in some Black Caps cricket from earlier in the week as well. And if you do want to support the Niche Case straight up the guts, that is the best way to do so. Patreon.com forward slash our Niche Case. And we're recording on a Thursday morning, which means tomorrow, Friday, is an email newsletter dispatch day. And if I was a big old fan of Aotearoa sport, I'd be looking forward to a Friday evening email coming from the Niche Cache, for sure. Always great content. Uh, there's some, usually some rugby league, usually some football, usually a bit of cricket, usually a bit of basketball pops up as well, let alone any of our other Aotearoa sporting beats. Actually, it'll be a major Lydia Ko. The major Lydia Ko times at the moment. She's uh, strolling through tournaments in Scotland. Fantastic uh, result last week, another top five finish, and now she's got another uh, big event on the LPGA Tour in Scotland this weekend as well. So there will be some more Lydia Co notes in that email dispatch as well, as well as all the niche cache content delivered straight to you. All the links, all the podcasts are part of that email newsletter. So sign up via Substack, the niche .com, and you'll find more Aotearoa sporting content to enjoy. We are here for a glorious podcast, and we always start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness wildcard. Maori or not? Yeah, dipping into the well of um, one of my favorite authors for this one, Mr. Herman Hesse, who said, the true profession of a man is to find his way to himself, which obviously unnecessarily gendered there but it doesn't only apply to men we're talking men in the sort of universal patriarchal sense there but um the true profession of a man is to find his way to himself you said who well, say the name of the geezer again herman hesse herman hesse so when you said herman i was thinking herman hesse hesse Mangere East Junior, Gold Coast <laughs> Titans so far off. And I was like, holy shit, Herman Hesse Hesse is dropping some fire wisdom to for our podcast. But uh, Herman Hesse, and repeat the mindfulness once again, sorry. The true profession of a man is to find his way to himself. Mm. The true self is basically your soul as well. Like That's your soulful energy. Yeah. The, the, the light of your soul that then shines forward through the darkness and it's a journey we can all relate to because you're you're battling your ego you're battling all the crazy thoughts in your head you're battling all the energies and uh factors and niggle and all the shit that comes from the outside that has taken you away from your true self and your soul so it's definitely a timely reminder to just focus on your true self. Yeah, and I like the um, 
I like the kind of journey aspect of that as well, where it's like you're um you're born and you're sort of led away from some kind of um uh, like some kind of origin point or you know you the the true nature the um the the soul or whatever like you kind of get further away from that and your job is to sort of circle back around and strip what strip everything else back to get to return to that point sort of thing or to return to that like i don't know pureness of being or whatever you want to whatever you want to say about it like that's um because he uses the word profession he doesn't say like your um your task or your, he's like profession like this is your job like this is this is the thing you're there like this is how you should be making a living is kind of thing it's um it's a nice way to put it it's like it puts the emphasis in a different kind of way where it becomes less about like a hobby or an interest and it becomes like a purpose you know i can't lie it would be kind of nice if you were just born into your true self and you didn't have to <laughs> yeah it would be but then you wouldn't be born at all if that was the case would you it's like oh no like if you were just born into your true self straight away you're just like you're just glowing as your true self no work and furries everything's honkadori and you just charge on through life like radiating your true self and your soulful energy um as nice as that sounds and as nice as that would be mad respect for the journey that to uh, <laughs> embark on you know that professional activity of finding your true self and um i'd say most people if they can't relate to that they should probably explore relating to that because um, yeah. <laughs> at some point you're going to come back around to your true self in your in your journey of life and whether it's earlier on in your life whether it's later in your life it's always there for you and it's uh as tricky as it can be it's a beautiful thing and your soul's there shining hard shining hard is a interesting phrase um Commonwealth... Sounds like an episode title <laughs> i thought you were gonna say again when you said air i was like sounds like an evanescence song or something like that that's where my mind went um commonwealth Ooh. games here wildcard shout out to herman sasa and shout out to evanescence for anyone who cares about both of those things together i highly doubt they're in there probably no one ever has <laughs> first strange, time you've been linked together in a sentence it's a strange old mix let's start with a bit of commonwealth games wild card where trucking along kiwis are winning medals everything's cool i'm finding a bit of focus in the three teams that i am most interested in which is the white ferns and both black sticks teams we have Black Sticks are playing, I think they're both playing against South Africa tonight, which is a big game for the blokes. So they're playing South Africa tomorrow morning, and they had that draw against Scotland, so they kind of need to sharpen up against South Africa. And they are, I believe they are tied on points, but ahead via goal difference. So that's a must-win game for the Black Sticks men against South Africa. Um, they're also tied on points with Pakistan. So this could get tricky if the Kiwis don't win. Um, but I expect the Black Sticks men to get a victory over South Africa. And that will take them into um, semi-finals where their opponents could be India or England, both winnable games. And then that could swing back around to a, a gold medal match against Australia, which they'll probably lose. But everything's everything starts with that game against south africa tomorrow morning and that's going to be a interesting encounter that the kiwis should win um and we'll we'll see how that goes the woman they also need a victory by the looks of it against south africa they are tied with uh, scotland on points but ahead on goal difference so again not getting in depth into the the type of results that need to happen and the goal difference and all that kind of shit but the the black sticks women need a win over south africa and they probably should get a win over south africa and the women are far better poised uh for games against australia like they don't have a victory over australia in at least 10 games since the start of 2021 
but unlike the men where there's a big disparity between goals scored and gold against against australia because australia tend to smoke the kiwis on the women's side there's a lot of draws and there's a lot of losses by one goal margin so the black sticks woman lost to australia by via a penalty stroke a one nil loss and that shows how competitive they are with australia and if they can swing back around to a gold medal match against australia anything is possible um so hopefully they beat south africa hopefully they finish second which will then probably lead to a game against again england or india the other thing wildcard that i'm interested in that you can probably touch on a bit is the white ferns cricket and they have had two good victories victory over south africa and a victory over sri lanka solid results good wins um but this sets up a fascinating time over the next few days because they face England, who are just look levels above the Kiwis. And if they lose that game, they should then face Australia. And they are, I'd say, easily the best teams at this uh, Commonwealth Games. And those two games are going to be informative about this new White Ferns era. Say. So, they were challenged against South Africa, less so against Sri Lanka, um, but their best players were still the likes of Sophie Devine, Susie Bates. So seeing them under pressure from England, especially in this in this game tomorrow morning, maybe? Um, Friday morning? Yes, Friday morning. England will put them under a lot of pressure and they will put, on, put the rest of the playing 11 under pressure as well. And how they respond will tell us a lot about this new kind of White Ferns era. I think Ben Sawyer's the coach. And he isn't he doesn't seem to have had a massive impact as far as like team selection. They went with Fran Jonas in the first game against South Africa, and then they replaced her with Rosemary Mir against Sri Lanka, which seems like, you know. Spin against South Africa, seam against Sri Lanka seems like a good idea. Interestingly, Eden Carson played both games, and I think that's a sign of the regard she is held in um, at that White Fern setup. So that's an insider gather with the new coaches, Eden Carson getting a lot of repetitions, and she's a gun in the field, so she offers a lot of value there as well. Um, but yeah, not learning too much about the White Ferns from those first two games. They were good games and good results to set up probably a medal for the White Ferns, I'd say. But bigger picture, learning about the White Ferns in this new era facing England and then probably Australia is going to provide a lot more insights. Yeah, because like um, <clears throat> from from what I can see from these first two games, like they were games where the White Ferns played well enough to win. Like, they delivered in the areas they need to deliver, relying a lot on their key players, in particular top of the batting order, as, as often is the case when they do win. Um, I think I'm right in saying they are a better 2020 team in general than they are an ODI team. So that's also a factor when you consider this, you know, the, the World Cup where they hit the... Um, I don't want to say rock bottom because that's a bit rude, but like, you know, they, they, they had a bit of a slump there, obviously, and moved on from coaches, moved on from a few players, very clearly try, trying to transition into um, something else, like a new era of this team that came in the ODI format. This is 2020 stuff. Um, and like, say what you want about the White Ferns, look into a new era. South African cricket seems to be going a little bit even further in that with their women's team. We're like, they're in a little bit of a shambles and having, you know, retirements that same as, you know, the Amy Satterthwaite's retired for, um, for, uh, for the white ferns, um, South Africa have lost, uh, Lizelle Lee and, um, I think Marazan Cap as well, eh? like two of their very, very best players no longer playing. Um, that's worse. Like that's, that's well, two, two key players lost is worse than one key player lost. You know what I mean? Both. Well, not so. Both of them aren't retirements. Lizelle Lee retired, but there's some there's some, some yeah. shenanigans behind that because there's like drama as to why she retired. Um, that to me, 
like South African men cricket was in turmoil up until very recently for at least like two years. Yeah. And we're talking serious turmoil, like um, investigations into racism and just all sorts of bullcucker kind of seems to have seeped into the women's te- team uh, on the back of a very strong World Cup. So Lizelle Lee retired in um, less than lovely circumstances and then Marazan Cup cap, she had to return to South Africa for family reasons. Um, and they are, right. I think they're also missing Dane Van Niekirk, who is a fantastic cricketer as well. So they've, they're without three great players. And also there's this backdrop of South African cricket um, always battling turmoil. So I just don't think they're as good right now as they could have otherwise been. No, I mean, you take, um, we've already taken Satterthwaite out of the White Ferns, but you also take out, let's say, um, Susie Bates and um, probably more of a, uh, I don't know, pick a bowler just to balance it out, um, so Amelia Kerr or something like that. Like, obviously, that's going to make a significant difference to the like competitiveness of any team. Um, so a good one over South Africa, a good one over Sri Lanka, who weren't even at the ODI World Cup, like didn't qualify. But um, it doesn't feel like what they've done is anything different to what they were doing in the two or three years leading up to that World Cup either, right? Like, do, does that does that strike you, right? Is it like they're beating the teams in the games they should win. Um, when they get good performances from their best couple of players, it's not like the the middle order or the you know the uh, a relatively raw bowling attack is the ones like leading them to victory here, playing the most important roles. Um, that's not really the case. It's the same old players doing that and providing the same sort of results they always get, which is why uh, what you're saying about you know the, the big test is yet to come, the next game, and then probably the game after that. Um, and then potentially the game after that, which I would imagine would be a most likely a third and fourth playoff. Um, but, you know, three big games to come up against better teams than they've played so far. And that is, yeah, that as you say, that's that's the test of has this team, um, I don't know, turned over new, a new leaf or whatever, or are they heading in a different direction? Is there an upward trend or whatever? Like, we don't find those things out from seeing the same kind of, performances that we've seen from them for several years we see that when they play better teams and how competitive they are there and it goes back to this like balance we're treading with the commonwealth games where the commonwealth games medal was like the whole experience for all these athletes is cool like we'd love to be an athlete in that sort of environment like it'll be awesome you're there with a bunch of kiwis you're meeting international athletes you're playing the sport you love it just seems like an absolute vibe and it would be awesome. And winning a medal at the Commonwealth Games is also awesome. Like we don't want to diminish those kind of tasks and those, just the buzz, like imagine being Eden Carson. Like you're just a youngster and you're at a Commonwealth Games. How fucking awesome would that be? Um, And it's, but then it's also, we look at these sports in the backdrop of this bigger picture. And as you're saying, like, it just seems like the same thing with the White Ferns. And I'd go further, like, there's no reason why Amy Satterthwaite and Francis Mackay shouldn't be in the team. And if they're in the team, I'm feeling a lot more confident about the White Ferns defeating England and defeating Australia. But that wasn't the object, like... It's hard to say you're gunning for a gold medal and to win the Commonwealth Games T20 competition when you haven't selected your best players. So that's the like messaging we as fans receive, and that kind of shades the the perspective that you look at the team through. And I'm just, I was like thinking like, how would this feel if it was just you inject Satterthwaite and Mackay into the team? Way better. <laughs> the team's way stronger like they're a threat um Jess Kerr's out injured and I think there was one Lauren Down she also um dipped out of the squad funnily enough because she needs a welfare break and again three welfare breaks in in two years now doesn't necessarily reflect well on the wider system around women's cricket now Teroa in the same way Lizelle Lee retiring now we're learning about it 
the background of her retirement being, um, you know, issues around how her body image is perceived. And just because she looks a certain way, she's under pressure to meet certain requirements. It's all like, it doesn't reflect well on South African cricket in the same way that multiple well-being breaks in a short period of time doesn't reflect well on not the white ferns environment necessarily, but the wider system and the challenges these Waiheni have to go through. So everything for the white ferns is very much, we're looking for a medal, but we're also trying to learn about a very strange sports team from Aotearoa that has had a lot of weird shenanigans, weird antics, is currently like without their best players for no decent reason at all, other than wanting to start a new era. And that process isn't, isn't conducive with winning. So it's all very strange. And to your point, Susie Bates, Sophie Devine, they're scoring the runs. And it's good. But the thing that's held the White Ferns back for at least four to five years now is that no one else scored runs to help Susie Bates, Sophie Devine, and Amy Satterthwaite during that phase as well. And I'm also just pondering wildcard. Leah Tahuhu hasn't taken a wicket. She looks happy. She looks in involved in the team. Weird situation for her. And she hasn't taken a wicket yet. So how does that look against the best team? She might step up and be the dominant force. That would be great. Also, Amelia Kerr isn't quite as dominant as a bowler as she was before. She's taken one wicket in either game, and this is coming after the World Cup where Amelia Kerr wasn't taking three wickets, four wickets, those type of performances that catapulted her into one of the best cricketers in the world. Right now, she's a great number three batter, and she's taken a wicket in either game, but against England, against Australia, Tohuhu and Amelia Kerr need to be snaring big wickets because that's how you... Instead of chasing 200, you're chasing 130, 140 if they're taking wickets. And those are the margins that keep the Aotearoa White Ferns in the contest against Australia and England. Yeah, I'm just looking at Kerr's figures. Because um, they've set relatively good totals batting first both times. So then she's been bowling in a you know defensive um, protector total kind of thing. One for 24 against... Um, South Africa and one for 22 against Sri Lanka. So both times like considerably, like notably easily under the required run rate. Um, and I think we might've spoken about this a little bit during the world cup. It feels like she's getting the Daniel Vittori treatment these days where it's like no more than one wicket, um, settle for a runner ball. Don't try to take anything more than that. Um, she's the, you know, she's the da most dangerous bowler in this New Zealand bowling lineup. Uh, oppositions are just like, we'll give her a set thing. Like, you know, Daniel Vittori is one for 35 type thing that he used to get from 10 overs in an ODI. It's like, we can't, we can't stop him from getting that, but we can not let him get anything more than that kind of thing. It feels like Kerr's getting a little bit of that kind of treatment these days. Which is a honor. Yeah, it is. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. That only happens to the best players. And taking one one wicket at four RPO in a T20 game like that is fantastic. But for the White Ferns to win games against the best teams in the world, to win medals, to win competitions, there needs to be greater cut through with their wickets. Because... Seam attack, they're all right arm medium paces. Hannah Rowe, Rosemary Mayer, Haley Jensen, Sophie Devine. Uh, Sophie Devine might be the White Ferns' best bowler. Like, seriously, like she is an excellent bowler. And the rest of the bowlers feel like a less good version of Sophie Devine's bowling, which, respectfully to them, is not a bad thing. And they're like, they're swinging the ball, they're bowling in good areas. But it also seems like that is easily smackable by England and Australian batters. Whereas Sri Lanka, they're going to struggle to hit sixes and fours against that type of bowling. Um, but then you're basically looking at four right arm seamers and a couple of spinners 
and if you if one right arm seam is not working well you're going to try another right arm seamer and there's no not much variety there and not much difference in skill sets either or styles of bowling so then you're looking at the spinners to offer a bit of variety and it just it does feel like opposition teams they're far more comfortable in dealing with Amelia Kerr's leggy wrong in flipper and not being bamboozled by that necessarily so she becomes a lot more important um and uh interested to see how Eden Carson goes against England not a huge turner of the ball but she does get great flight and she is quite accurate as well I think she is a better cricketer than Fran Jonas and I think Eden Carson should be selected ahead of Fran Jonas in T20 cricket Fran Jonas is a fantastic one day bowler I think Eden Carson offers more value as a fielder and a bowler in T20 cricket Facing England is a monster challenge for someone like Eden Carson, let alone the more experienced players like England know what Leah Tahuhu does. And they can play a pull shot. So bowling short, like you can bowl short. This is the this is the nuance of international cricket on the women's side because you can bowl short against Sri Lanka and they're not going to pull you for six. And so you've got a team-wide strength that aligns with their weakness against England and Australia they're going to pull you for six so the weapon you're choosing becomes your weakness and those are the differences in the international teams it's not just like one team's good one team's bad it's like the good team has a whole different skill set to the bad team and how the Kiwi skill set of like their swing and trying to bounce opposition batters out and um, having a leggy, having a, a wrong it that could bamboozle a weaker team, how that all looks against England and Australia, let alone can Sophie Devine slug England bowlers? Like, is she going to be whacking sixes off Catherine Brunt? Because she can do it against Sri Lanka and South Africa. Is that same hot start going to be possible against England because you look at the white fans batting lineup it goes Divine and Bates Amelia Kerr which is front loaded that is like the definition of a front loaded batting lineup and if you uh they have done well the opening duo have done well they've seen out the first five overs in both games and they've scored both in both games both batters have scored with strike rates over 100 so what happens if England get an early wicket what happens if they're restricting the run scoring and those type of things? What's if they take three wickets in the first six overs? Can we lose? <laughs> oh, no, can't. Let's just say, can the White Ferns deal with that adversity? And these are the questions that not only determine Commonwealth game success, these are the questions and these are the issues with the White Ferns that have hindered their progress in recent years. And we need to yeah. learn about these things to set up how we view the White Ferns moving forward. Because if those issues aren't solved, we're going to be dealing with the same White Ferns problems year after year in the coming years until there is some sort of drastic change. Sticking with cricket here, Wildcard, Black Caps are in, uh, they're facing Netherlands now. Two T20 international games massive tour this one it's the, exhausting isn't it <laughs> the black caps are returning their rivalry against netherlands and in a quirk of international cricket michael Rippon played for <laughs> netherlands against the black caps a few months ago now he's uh he's he's hoping for a game against netherlands for aotearoa what are you thinking about wildcard i've done a few black caps spotlights of you know who the fuck knows how we're viewing a two-game series against Netherlands, but in the wider context, what are some things you're thinking about and pondering as the Black Caps enter their series against Netherlands with the first game tomorrow morning? So tomorrow morning, White Ferns, Black Caps, men's hockey. That's my recipe for a Friday morning. Yeah, my recipe is a bit of all of the above and then add in some um, 
I think there should be some calm games. Athletics still on at that point. Tom, I'm not sure if Tom Walsh is on tomorrow or if, um, cause I don't know if he's done the qualifiers yet, but he should be up sometime. You don't really need to watch Tom Walsh. You just maybe just watch the, the first throw of the final and then you'll get an idea if he's going to win a gold or if there's any possibility of not. Um, but he should like, to be completely honest, he should comfortably win a gold. I mean, he was fourth at the world champs uh, a couple of weeks ago behind three Americans, none of whom are going to be there this time, right? So he should be all right. Um, and also... Okay, so Tom Walsh, he is, he's happy about colonization. He's like, yo. That's he's good. just wishing the the um, the Mayflower or the, who, Columbus. He's just wishing that the, they never made it to America. It's what they have to... Colonization was great until they went to America. <laughs> That's his idea. Um, we just wipe that country out. We'll just like ignore them, build a big wall around all of their other things. They wanted to build a wall at one point. So we'll, the rest of the world can build a wall to keep them in and just like exclude America from everything else. And we'll be, we'll be sweet. Um, Tom Walsh certainly will be. Uh, I would also check in on my Friday morning though as well. There's some, um, uh, Europe, same as the last couple of weeks, there's Europa Conference League qualifying matches going on, which means more opportunity for Max Mata and uh, Nando Pineker. And also Joe Bell um, at their respective clubs got, got, uh, we're up to the third round of Conference League qualifying, which is like the third tier tournament of European football. It's only the second year they've had it. it used to be Champions League, then Europa League, then Conference, then nothing. And then now it's Champions League, Europa League, Conference League. Um, Third round is the last round before the playoff round, which is the last round before the group stage. So they're two ties away. They've gone through the first two ties successfully, both those teams. Um, we're talking about Sligo Rovers for Mata and Pinica and then uh, Ballot Bromby. And two ties, like they're right at the halfway side, stage, two ties away from um, from uh, making the group stage there, which no New Zealander has yet done so. Um, the only one who played qualifying last year was Ryan DeVries with Sligo Rovers. He left. To, they signed two other Kiwis in his place, so that worked out all right. Um, so that's also on the, the agenda Friday morning. I think that's like 5.30 or 6 o'clock kickoffs we're talking there. So um, I'm going to run out of screens, I think. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do that. As to the Black Cap stuff, I just want to see, like, at this point, swept Ireland in ODIs and T20s, swept Scotland in, OD, in T20s and an ODI, two games against Netherlands, just don't drop the ball, you know, just, just if, if balls um, high up in the air, dropping down, just make sure you get that light reverse cup, go and take the catch and complete a 100% successful winning um, European leg of the tour, which is what they would have been hoping for, particularly after a disappointing test series against England. It's also what they're on the verge of achieving, you know, just do it, like do it now, win a couple more games, um, close it out, and sweep the minnows, basically. Is Sligo a town? I believe so. I think there is a place called... I think it is the name of the thing. Um, I don't know anything more about Irish geography, but... Well, get a quick Google up and I'll, I'll fill the void. Because I was thinking, like, Sligo... So you, you started off talking about football, and in my mind I was thinking... Yeah, there's nothing doing with the black caps, so who gives a shit? They're, they're gonna. They're I wonder gonna... if they went because they, they were just playing in Ireland, right? I wonder if they. Um, I wonder if the black caps went to any Sligo Rovers games, or if um, Max Mata and Nando Pinica went to any black caps games while they were there, because they could have. Do you remember when the All Whites were playing? Uh, Pinica would have been in that team, but Mata wasn't when they were playing at the. What was it? Why were the black caps in the UAE? It was the World, World Cup T Twenty World T Twenty World Cup? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the All Whites had a training session in the morning, and then went and watched the Black Caps in the in the evening. It was cool as. They do. Maybe they did that again. They do welcome a lot of like Kiwi cricketers from around the world into their like training camps and stuff like that. When they are overseas, I saw recently Brett Hampton, Northern Districts cricketer. He's playing in oh, the yeah. Netherlands, and they he came along to one of the trainings. Um, you know, when they're playing in England, they'll get some of the county lads to pop in. Not sure of the geographical stuff with uh was that where, in ireland they play like mal Hyde or something like that so i'm not sure where that is in relation to sligo 
if Sligo is a place that exists? Um, I think Malahide is Dublin area, I think. So I think basically they played the ODI series in Dublin and the um, and the T20 series in Belfast, I think, which one is Republic of Ireland, one is the capital of Republic of Ireland, one is the capital of um, Northern Ireland. But Sligo is, um, is a coastal seaport um, and county town of County Sligo in Western Ireland. Uh, it comes, the name comes from a Irish word, which means abounding in shells, which makes sense for a coastal town, right? So, so what's the, is it just those two Kiwis who have played for Sligo, like Max Matter and Nando Pineke? Nando Pineke, yeah. Um, well, Ryan DeVries was there for a couple of years beforehand. Um, and there was some history gone back a bit further i can't remember what it was i think kevin fallon played for them like way back when he wasn't any relationship to new zealand at that time this was before he moved out here and uh married local and stayed and coached a bunch but um i believe he played for them way back in the day as well um i'm trying to think if he would I don't, I don't know what school max matter went to but it's a possibility they might that he could have coached him at um at first 11 thing well i'm not sure about that i don't know uh but yeah there's they, they have it a little bit of a um in recent times because ryan devries was there for a couple of seasons soon as he leaves they sign max matter and nando penica so it's fun when you get those little things and by coincidence as well the team that they're playing in the next round of the conference league is viking from norway which Joe Bell played a season and a half for up until very recently until he moved to Bromby. And um, yeah, it's strange how these same things, the same clubs tend to pop up over and over. But I guess it's not strange. You have networks and you have like existing relationships and you need a player, you go sign someone that the last guy knows or, or whatever, you know. And they're Kiwis. So those teams are like, well, these guys were nice. These guys did their job. These guys, yeah. were, you know, helped us on the footy. <laughs> they field. tidied up the dressing room afterwards, you know? Yeah. Like we need more of those dudes. And I'm not like, I'm, <laughs> if you're a big man basketballer from Aotearoa, you're like, surely Oklahoma city or like, yeah, this, this guy's a seven foot Kiwi. We need him and our team. Like, yeah. cause, the, cause the last one was fantastic. Steven Adams, you know, if all Kiwis are like Steven Adams, holy shit. I think that's a big thing is just how because you like yeah the the world of scouting and agents might be a bit you know there's links but it's also quite weird but if you have a good experience with a kiwi you're going to be fizzing to get another kiwi and it goes for like uh league cricket in england like if you bring over some kiwi who's playing plunker shield whatever and he's doing his job on the sports field but also he's a fantastic person off the field the next overseas person you want to sign will probably also be a kiwi and i think that's that might be a factor with some of this football stuff um for sure i i've got to imagine so especially when like it's funny that matter and pinnaka ended up at the same club at sligo because they also played together at um grasshopper zurich and and um mm. in uh switzerland so they they were teammates there and their first professional gigs overseas and then a couple clubs later for each of them end up at the same club in ireland that feels like it's probably not a coincidence like surely that's some kind of a um maybe they share an agent or something like that i someone said that um the new phoenix's um bulgarian import bosina krayev i think is how you say his name has the same agent as saprit singh or something or his agent saprit singh's agent recommended him to the club or something like that it's like these the the whole small world um idea is kind of more more prominent than you think even in the big wide world of uh big wide messy world of professional football let's dive into some let's do a big segment here wildcard just on the nrl and aotearoa rugby league because we are things are getting quite interesting we're approaching some finals footy and there's a massive aotearoa presence in some really big games uh, this weekend, especially, which is where we'll zone in on starting tonight. You got the Roosters versus Broncos. Doesn't get much more Kiwi and RL than Roosters versus Broncos right now. Joey Manu is on fire. He's starting at center for the Roosters. Wadeo Hargraves there. 
Broncos have Dean Mariner and Jordan Ricky. Tamita Martin has just signed uh, with the Warriors as well. Interested to see what happens there, just because I think like Sean's Nickel Clockstad starting at fullback in reserve grade. And there's this whole like yarn, yeah, the family. Family's always a factor and all that stuff. Like it's all it's all real, it's all legit. Also lost his NRL spot. So if you're moving clubs, that that might be the main reason why. And I don't think Nickel Clockstad's gonna be a fullback at the Warriors. I think Timari Martin could be a fullback at the Warriors. Um, and the Broncos' best footy, low key, came with Tamari Martin starting at fullback. I think he won like five or six consecutive games upon his return to the NRL after Waikato hibernation. So that's just something interesting there. He won't play against the Roosters, but um, he did sign with the Warriors. Just another opportunity to see Dean Mariner play for the Broncos is a big one. And. Ooh, he might line up against Joseph Manu. Oh, I think so. Dean Mariner started at left center for the Broncos last week. Joey Manu usually plays right center. So hopefully we do get Joey Manu versus Dean Mariner. That is absolutely bonkers. Manu from Tokoroa, Dean Mariner from Auckland, Mara Saints Jr. Ooh, that's, that is just blowing my mind, wildcard. Any thoughts on Joey Manu versus Dean Mariner or any uh, Roosters Broncos yarn? Um, I don't know. Manu versus Mariner is very much like, um, you know, the the emerging force kind of thing against like the dude who's been there for several years established as like potentially the best player in that position in the entire NRL, like even beyond a Kiwi NRL thing. He might be the best center in the NRL. Like, um it's it's not quite master and apprentice because it's not like they come up together or one's like mentored the other one but kind of in a symbolic way that's exactly what it is in a, in a you know in a in a different line of thinking in a metaphorical sense you know that's that's what i i always like when those kind of um connections happen you know <laughs> when you can draw in like this big almost like mythological um context to a to a match up like that so yeah, that's probably one to keep a bit of an eye out for. I would, I would, um, I would hazard a suggestion. They are similar in how they like. Dean Mariner's played one game, so it's a small sample <laughs> size. But I did like Joey Manu came into the NRL, stepping, offloading, just being everything he was at all levels below that. And that was my main takeaway about Dean Mariner's debut: is he just did the same shit he's been doing in Queensland Cup. And he did it at the NRL level without it looking too difficult for him. So there's that similarity, but they are quite different as centers. Like Joey Manu is a playmaking center in the sense that he's going to put on a step, he's going to find space, he's going to offload. And as he's matured, we've seen him pop up in a wide range of spots, um, taking a hit up, playing like a second fullback type of role. Dean Mariner had one offload in six or seven reserve grade games off the top of my head. And he didn't offload in his debut. So his skill set is more speed and physicality. Like he he doesn't look massive. Like it's always distorted when you're watching on telly, but he doesn't look massive on the field, but he does look quite powerful. He's, he's quick, he's silky, he's classy, but he's not a playmaker like Joey Manu. And that's just the low key difference to Ponder because he doesn't have the offloading skill set sorted in the same way Joey Manu does as probably my, maybe the best offloading outside back there ever has been. Storm versus Titans, like we're gunning for a uh, Storm win there and who cares? Manly Seagulls versus Parramatta Eels is given what I've said about Dylan Brown, that's a interesting contest. Obviously, Manly Seagulls, they've got their situation ongoing um, and all their players are back. But Alfred Smalley drops out and he wasn't named in reserve grade either. So he might he must have injury or suspension. I don't know. Um, but he's... I'm actually curious where Alfred Smalley goes from here because he is a bit 
down on the Manly Seagulls wing depth chart. And this wasn't like, I didn't see this like announced as news, but Raymond Tuaimalo Vainga, who is another Maris Saints junior, he's, he was, he's been in the, uh, Sea Eagles wider squad a few times extended bench, and he's a starting winger and he played in a trial earlier this year. But I think he might have been part of that Sea Eagles situation. So he didn't get the call up. Alfred Smalley got the call up. And like if you're a Melbourne Storm and you're looking for some outside back type of depth, Smalley is someone who I think if he if the opportunities aren't there with the Seagulls, Smalley is someone who other teams might be looking at because otherwise just stuck in reserve grade and um someone like a team like the Storm, so they're missing their outside their top tier outside backs so i think will wildbrook is out injured as well so he hasn't got the call up the promotion and then you're missing the first second third tackle hit ups from your own try line so what do the best teams do they've got brian toto they've got mike Acevo. like the tigers aren't the best team but they have ken mamalo doing that job you need some power in your outside backs for those early carries the sharks have mulatalo it's all there. Smalley is someone who could offer that. And I just thought, randomly, I just thought he might be a good fit with the, the Melbourne Storm. But I'm hoping he gets some more NRL footy moving forward. I'm not sure where he sits with the Sea Eagles because they do have a lot of outside back depth as well. But yeah, Eels versus Sea Eagles. We're looking at the Eels. I'm just always fascinated by the Eels. They're chasing finals footy. It's kind of all doom and gloom now without Mitchell Moses, but again, we know they have one of the best Kiwi NRL crews in the competition, Dylan Brown in the halves, Isaiah Papali'i on the edge, Makahisi Makatoa from New Plymouth, he's always a low-key monster, and Maratu Nekore rounding out the bench. Do you have any thoughts on Dylan Brown there, Wildcard, just after the... Uh, I chucked him up in the hot take segment on the Variety Show, no Mitchell Moses, Dylan Brown... What are you kind of thinking about as a uh, a fellow Northlander? How about that? Well, you you laid out a nice um, case for how this has been a bit of a um, I was going to say a breakout season for him because um, he's you know had he's um, what was the thing he's he's doubled his try oh he's beaten all of his try assists tallies combined for his previous three seasons or whatever, and then he's also got the most tries he's ever scored in an NRL season, so. Um, he's clearly, I was, <laughs> the reason I laughed at the idea of it being a breakout season is because it feels like every year has been a breakout season for him. Like he, he bursts onto the scene as a rookie and then he gets even better the next year. It's like, oh, this is the break. And then he gets even better the next year. And the same thing is continuing to happen. This feels like a bit of a, um, because they are in like crucial must win. I mean, they're in the, they're in the, um, where are they? Sixth as it stands, um, potentially only two points off third, but points difference is not their friend there um and there are you know five or six teams competing for maybe two spots below them so if they do drop points with um with mitchell moses out suddenly they get dragged back into that mix so there's there's no guarantee they will make the top eight even they're in, though they're in a good position right now so they do need to be winning these games um but it does feel like a little bit of a rare situation for dylan brown where like because who's gonna Who's going to replace Moses? Um, do you know? Jacob the name? Arthur. Oh, there you go. Um, so Dylan Brown effectively gets to be like the senior half in that combination, I'd imagine. Um, and that is something that we've seen this like progressively him adding new skill sets to his game and just becoming more and more effective in more ways, continually to like continuing to grow as an NRL player with each season. But this feels like a little window where it's something different that we haven't seen from him before, where it's like he gets to be the guy, um, even if just for you know a couple of weeks, but there are a couple of very important weeks where they really need to be grinding out a win or two. Um, that does feel like a little, it's not ideal. <laughs> You'd rather just have a full strength team, um, but it does feel like a nice little opportunity for him to really like 
I don't know, stamp his case a little bit more and, and you know, put his hand up to, because a lot of the credit at the Eels does go to guys like Moses and, you know, um, Gutherson and guys like that for good reason. But like Dylan Brown has also been doing an ex- outstanding job alongside those guys. And then maybe there's, here's like a little, a spotlight window for him to, to do something that he maybe hasn't done in the, or hasn't had the opportunity to do in his in our career today, you know? Especially when his, so his playmaking stats are, have blown previous stuff out, as we've discussed. He's also like averages like 119 meters, I think it was, per game. And you'd struggle to find a half who averages 100 running meters per game. May, I think off the top of my head for two consecutive seasons, like we're all out here hoping Sean Johnson runs for 60 meters. Yeah. Right. Like Dylan Brown and Jerome Hughes, those type of dudes, they are running a hundred meters every single game. However, that hit all his like extra playmaking and stuff like that has come at the expense of his kicking. So this season he's done far less kicking. So what do you need to do with no Mitchell Moses, Dylan Brown, like everything you're discussing to me just is his kicking game. And that is the extra development wrinkle that hopefully we can see is that he runs, he gets his hundred meters running the footy. He tackles, like he misses one or two tackles. You can't target Dylan Brown defensively, but he's literally just a edge forward when you think about it. He averages 100 meters per game and maybe 10 to 15 tackles at 90%. That's what you want from your edge forward. And Dylan Brown's doing it as a 22-year-old half. Now we're looking to see if he can control the game. Can he kick to the corners? Can he execute the right kick at the right time? And take a bit of pressure off Jacob Arthur, take a bit of pressure off Clint Gutherson. And I don't know, like... This is a Kiwi NRL bias because we're from Aotearoa, but I'm kind of thinking if everyone else just does the same shit and Dylan Brown showcases a few more wrinkles, then the pan- then the Eels are in a good spot. Um, and I'd, I'd also suggest like the Eels, as we've discussed a few times, their development, Dylan Brown's got better every season. Isaiah Papali has got better every season at the Eels. Manati Niakore got better every season. That doesn't happen at every NRL club, and the Eels should be uh, commended for that from a Kiwi NRL perspective. Raiders versus Panthers is also an interesting contest wildcard because you're going to get Matthew Tomoko coming up. Probably, I think it is Isaac Isaac Tungo. He'll probably start at uh, left center for the Panthers. Tomoko plays right center for the Raiders. And again, Tomoko's got a bit of buzz now. You know, the Aussies are starting to look at Tomoko for his consistent mahi, powerful runner, just does his job at centre. And we hear a lot about the Panthers' youngsters, their development system, and Isaac Tungo is part of that. He's starting at centre. He's sealed his spot. Well, let's see how you go against uh, young Tomoko. Then wildcard, we've got Joseph Tarpane versus James Fisher-Harris. Now, that is ridiculous again. And I'm always fascinated, like, just the the reputation of Josh Papali'i. Fantastic middle forward. You know, one of the best middle forwards over the past decade. But Joseph Tarpane do, is doing more work, more efficiently, this season than Josh Papali'i. And it's like... They start the game, they've got, they're both fantastic. They're busting tackles, making PCMs, getting offloads. And then Papa Lee goes off the field and they like, they'll, they'll make a song and dance about it. They'll cut to a shot of Josh Papa Lee going to the bench and like another great stunt from Papa Lee. Next minute, Joseph Tarpin is taking a hit up. He gets 10 meters and he gets an offload and he's still gone. It's like, I'm just kind of fascinated by how Joseph Tarpin, he's got better. He just keeps getting better as well. Um, And I think he is undisputably top five middle forwards in the NRL. He's better than Papali'i. I don't like, Papali'i might be top five, but Tarpane is better than him. And he's coming up against James Fisher-Harris. 
who was perennially top five middle forward as well. But also you got Moses Liotta, new Aotearoa Kiwis middle forward. He's also starting at prop. So you got Papali'i. I mean, he's born in Auckland, so a bit of a you know, bit of a factor. <laughs> um, Papali'i and Joseph Tarpane versus Moses Liotta and James Fisher Harris. That is brutal. Um, but specifically, Tarpane versus James Fisher Harris. They are both excellent middle forwards and very quite different in their mahi as well. Like Tarpane offloads tackle bus, quite a roving middle forward. He'll run across field to do some footwork, and he's a physical beast like don't run into him and definitely if you're like a little aaron booth type of i was about to drop a c word and i'll refrain from doing so you know kids or parents might be listening but if you're a little aaron booth type of c word and you're diving at joseph tarpany's legs you deserve to be ragdolled you know like that is joseph tarpany wellington's finest he's an absolute monster don't do that to him um, but again, fun Kiwi and IRL battle with some of these players. Yeah, that's um, Tapani versus Fisher Harris is basically like heavyweight title fight kind of kind of areas there. That's um, that's that's something else. That's not even like what we're saying before about um, Dean Mariner and and Joseph Manu, where it's like the emerging guy against the established star. It's like here's just two established stars. <laughs> it's like bang, you know. Um, that's yeah. That's that's some nice appointment. Uh, what's that one? Saturday night. Um, oh, right before the Dragons game, which we probably won't talk about much because <laughs> we're talking the oh, dude, uh, thing. But... We... You might have some shark stuff to talk about. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not um, talking about the dragons, but I'm talking about the sharks because Braden Hamlin Uele coming into the starting uh, lineup. Really? There, there you go. Uh, he's, I think, he battled injury injury for a while, and then he came off the bench for a few weeks, and now he gets an opportunity uh, with an injury to Royce Hunt. So Braden Hamlin Uele comes in, and he's an interesting player to track because. 2019 he was playing for the Aotearoa Kiwis and I don't think he was far off the squad for the recent Kiwis test against Tonga um but he had to play some footy he was out injured so he's come back in now he's starting and like you're not looking Brandon Hamlin you added doesn't do Tarpon at Fisher Harris type of stuff but he does bend the line and he is a weapon close to the try line he's a I've always been fascinated by the idea of just having different shapes and sizes in your team, especially in your forward pack, because every shape and size means you have to tackle differently. And Braden Hamlin and Newell is more a bit more of a wrecking ball. He's not rotund, but he's he's more of a wrecking ball type of middle forward. And he's different to Tarpany and Fisher Harris, but he is very effective in progressing the ball up the middle of the field, very efficient 10 meter per run type of stuff. And now he's starting against the dragons and the dragons don't have many strengths wild card, but their forward pack is quite good. So how Braden Hamlin, Uele, Glenora Bears Jr. Off the top of my head, how he goes against this uh, dragons team will be interesting. And the sharks, the local derby, they'll obviously smoke the dragons. In the second half dragons have been good in the first half against better teams and then like the last week against the cowboys blown out in the second half when it looked close up to that point brewster's game a couple weeks ago same deal um dragons are probably in like must win territory now because they're maybe not in terms of points but their points difference is so bad that that's effectively another loss on their you know they're going to lose a tiebreaker against whoever they come up against so only if what five games to go um they might need to win all five of those to make the top eight, which they're probably not going to do because they're not going to win all five of those. But it is a it is a big game, whereas the Sharks are scrapping for second, aren't they? Um, they're currently third and playing quite well, and therefore, like, I don't know. Um, second place is definitely they're they're two points off, but points difference again, they're about a hundred behind North Queensland. So, um interesting game there where it maybe doesn't have as much on the line in terms of like um 
you know, must win for both teams kind of things where it's like, it's not necessarily a must win for Cronulla. It is a must win for the Dragons, but they're probably not going to win. Um, but I don't know. And maybe the Dragons will get up against a better team for once. They haven't done that. <laughs> they haven't done that basically at all this season. They've been good at beating teams they should beat and then lose. They've also got, you remember when the Phoenix last year, um, <clears throat> Phoenix last season had that thing where like when they scored the first goal, they always won or drew. Um, and when they conceded the first goal, they always lost. Um, I think it lasted the entire season. I'm not actually sure. Uh, if it did, then they kept it up in their FFA Cup win um, last night, or Australia Cup it's called now. So they scored first, one 4 0 against uh, Brisbane Strikers, I believe they're called. Um, old mate Keegan Smith was in goal, former Phoenix player once upon a time, was in goal for Brisbane there. So. But the Dragons have the same thing going this year, where when they concede the first try, they lose, and when they score the first try, they win. It's a, it's a weird one how that can be such a decisive factor. Um, and yet, over, if it happens over the course of a season, you kind of think, well, I can't just be a fluke. Like, there's, there's something about it. When, when they play well, they score first. When they don't play well, they concede first. So um, this game is what I'm saying. This game is one that could be decided in the first five minutes of Canberra, of, um, of Cronulla score an early try, which they probably will. It'll probably be Bradley um, hamlin Ueli. So there you go. As we know, Dragons, probably the worst Kiwi NRL club to ever exist. Yeah, disappointing, that one. However, Wildcard, there is a new development. Uh, the bro, Navajo Doyle, he has progressed from SG Ball with the Dragons, and he's played a few Jersey Fleet games recently for the Dragons. Young hooker from Auckland, uh, went to King's College, uh, played a lot of league in Auckland as well. He is in the Dragon system and he's he's playing Jersey Flag. So you might have a Kiwi NRL present there, you know, in five years' time or something. I don't know. But um, might get a game later in the season if they lose and they're out of contention and start rolling through some backups for next season as his teams are want to do. You know, that maybe maybe that's the thing to cheer for. Big Sharks win this weekend and then the Dragons can start rotating. No, that doesn't happen. There's, they've already, there's already been leaks from the thing complaining about how the coach only wants to pick his Broncos boys. So, you know, don't think we'll get that rotation going. Do you know what the weirdest shit is? This happened, like, it literally happened with the All Blacks and maybe the Dragons in the same week. It's like, shit's hitting the fan, so we'll fire the assistant coaches. It's yeah. Like, you're, you're cool. Like, great. Like, not the head coaches, just the assistant yeah. coaches. <laughs> and it's like, uh, like, so for the, like, especially for the All Blacks, it's like, okay, but it's clear you're only making a move because you feel pressured to do so. Because mm. if you're going to make a real move, which I don't think the All Blacks should be doing, like, everyone needs to chill the fuck out, but if you're going to make a real move, you make a real move. But it's happened a few times, like there was, uh, I think the Gold Coast Titans, their coach was under pressure old Holbrook. And so what do they do? They get rid of the assistant coach, yeah. Jim Dimmick. The symbolic it, move. It, it's, it, it literally is symbolic and it means nothing. It just means like, well, we like the coach, but we're un we feel under the pump. And just because we feel under the pump, we feel like we have to do something. Not because we want to do something. We just feel like we have to do something. So we're going to do the least relevant thing possible and get rid of the assistant coaches. Like it's a weird situation. It is a very weird situation, especially in that all-plex situation where it's like they, um, the dude that they hired instead, old, um, old mate uh, Ryan, was supposed to, I think he was going to be on the prospective thing for the other dude that everyone else seems to want as coach right now. Um, he was on his, uh, Scott Robertson's like short list of um, of assistants, which they had to present at their um, job applications for some reason. You got to they wanted the ready made teams to go, and they said that Foster's um, his like, apparently his uh, backroom staff was like of a higher. It was one of the things in his favor, and they've just fired one of them to hire someone from the other camp. So strange, strange yarns. Um, that reminds me as well, because we we're talking about Max Mata before living in Ireland and some of the connections there with like um, all whites and black caps. 
I've read two separate articles, like separate quotes, different interviews um, with Max Matter in recent times because you know he signed like a he signed a new contract recently. He's scored a few goals, so he's done a couple like interview things. And the Irish people keep asking him about rugby. It's like, <laughs> what's it like living in Ireland when the All Blacks just lost the series to Ireland? And he's like, well, I mean, I don't really care about rugby. <laughs> it's his answer. It's like I. I might watch it if I'm like at home and there's a barbecue on and the All Blacks game is on or something, but I really don't like check out the results or whatever. I'm like a footballer and that's kind of the path I've taken and I'm not, not that interested in whether the All Blacks win or lose. It was quite a funny little scenario to get chucked in there as well, but it's particularly funny because it feels like exactly what Kiwi media would do to an Irishman who was living here if the you know tables had been flipped the other way around. Like say there was an Irishman playing for the Crusaders or something like that, or um, or for the Phoenix, let's say we'll keep the sporting thing. Let's say the um, Phoenix had an Irishman and then the All Blacks beat Ireland over there or something, and it'd be like, ah, what do you reckon about the rugby? And we'd be like, I don't care, like I'm not interested in that. Um, but I think so what Max Matter doing good things for the country there by by spreading the sporting wealth. Yeah, I think Max Matter was getting more into the zone of like, well, Alteto is the best sporting nation in the world, and that's because we love a lot of sports and we're really yeah. good at a lot of different sports. But yeah. um, your example that you are talking about, I was thinking like if what would happen is the, the Aotearoa media or someone would be like, okay, Mr. Irishman, but what did you think about the All Blacks performance? Yeah. Because that's literally <laughs> all they do. And now it's South Africa. So now it's not Kiwis. It's literally just the Kiwi media who are who can't analyze a game themselves. They can't come up with their own, uh, like logical opinions so they go to south africa to see what the south africans are saying and the northern they... hemisphere one's always good let's see what renowned all black um you know fisherman type uh clickbaity type fellas what do they think about the all blacks losing like well they hate the all blacks and say it every time every opportunity they get so let oh, i wonder what they wonder what they have to say you know? it's, it's such an insecure thing to go um digging for those We'll see it if uh, like maybe the best example is if like your political party A, and then you're like, oh, to learn about our party, we're going to see what political party B is saying about political party A, and that's going to inform us about ourselves. And say so, you can just come. You mean to the your party own... whose ideas are formed about being the exact opposite of your own party, and vice versa. <laughs> like, gee, I wonder how that's going to go. Um, shout out to the All Blacks. They're playing South Africa uh who knows what will happen there because we don't care we're here for <laughs> neither does max matter yeah shout out max matter you're matter you're a fantastic uh representative of valtero sport um and how do we get the uh, dragons assistant coaches so we're looking for big changes yeah. with the dragons because they fired their assistant coaches. everything will be better now yeah and and nothing's going to change um because yeah, you, you get actual change. If you really want change, you get actual change when you do fire a coach like the Bulldogs, and everything changes. Yeah. So maybe that's a lesson to everyone involved. If like, fair play. If you don't want to make a change, that is all good. Because I personally think the All Blacks could have just rode this wave of adversity with no changes. That's fine. But if you do want to make a change, actually make a change. The Bulldogs made a change, and now they're a funky, fun, entertaining team. Dragons made the assistant coach changes, and they're not making the finals wildcard. Like, you're quite hopeful. No, there, it's not going to happen. They're, they're probably the most mundane inter, uh, NRL team currently in existence. However, Bulldogs versus Cowboys. Bulldogs, I'm actually liking the work of Jeremy Marshall King and Zach Docker Clay. Docker Clay, he was a junior Kiwi back in the day, alongside Timare Martin. Um, but he's a bit of a journey, went to England. And I think he spent time in the Seagulls system. And now he's getting, he made his debut this year with the Bulldogs and he's getting a good run there. Jeremy Marshall King off to the Redcliffe Dolphins next season. What do we know about the Redcliffe Dolphins? Half their squad is from Aotearoa. Um, also, Cowboys. Uh, big Griffin the Army lover over here. Wrote about him recently. I've done two Kiwi NRL spotlights on Griffin the Army. Wrote about him the second one. Last week, I think it was. Then he scored a try. Um, straight up the guts. He's a... Against the Dragons. 
against the dragons great middle yeah. defense from the dragons um Griffin the army. I don't know what it is about him. He's just a massive unit, and he moves well. But every run is he pokes through. It's kind of a bit of a tap. I've got a bit of a tarpenny vibe about Griffin the army. There it is. I've found it. Bit of a tarpenny vibe. Interesting. He's just like he doesn't resemble Fisher Harris. Maybe like maybe a bit of Jesse Bromwich. But he needs to build up the mana, whereas like the he he just feels like he has a similar style about his work as uh, Joseph Tarpany, and if we're poking fun at teams and NRL clubs wildcard, I just find nothing as entertaining as the Newcastle Knights. Like I I I watched that game against the Bulldogs because the Bulldogs are fun and entertaining, but also the Newcastle Knights somehow are terrible despite this whole idea of like Newcastle Knights fans are the best they still show out to watch their team at home games and like they are, the fans are rewarded with just more shitty Newcastle Knights football at home and that brings me around to this idea wild card that we always talk about there's always a team worse than the Warriors like don't worry about that whether it's uh worse at footy or worse than worse in terms of drama as well. Warriors don't win the wooden spoon. Warriors don't like have weird dramas like these Australian clubs. So no matter how you feel about the Warriors, there's always a team that is worse than the Warriors. And if you do want to binge some um, crappy NRL stuff, watch the Newcastle Knights because they're facing the Aotearoa Tigers another jam-packed kiwi nrl tigers outfit stafford toa asukepa oa kema malo fa'amanu brown kalmatua langi austin diaz is on the bench still hoping for a massive uh tigers victory here wild card i do like the tigers when they're they're trucking along nicely and lots of kiwi nrl flavor in their team especially i referenced mamalo before loving his work as well if you every time you watch Mamalo run, he runs ridiculously hard. He's a massive unit. He runs it straight, no handbrake. But he does have a a step, and this is something I saw at the Warriors. I think it's usually a left foot step. So imagine you've got this massive dude running at you. He's winding up, and you're f defensively winding up. You're like you're getting re getting ready for the contest. Your shoulders are ready, and you're lining him up. And you know if there's a big unit running straight at you, he's probably going to run straight at you. So that's like your whole defensive mindset. Mamalo's always got a step. And that's not a cowardice thing. Like, no, you're not running it straight. Oh, what? You've got a handbrake. That type of shit, it's a weapon. And I just, I'm amazed by like his continued mahi and, and how he's progressed with the Tigers as well after that niggly departure from the Warriors. But he's kind of settled into a groove there with the Tigers. And I'm happy for him, actually. Um, and some of these other Tigers, like Kalmatua Lungi's off to the Sea Eagles next season. Still waiting to make sure Isaiah Papali makes the moves from Eels to Tigers. But for some of these young Kiwi NRL Tigers, Toa, Kepa Oa, uh, Austin Diaz, like even Fa'amanu Brown, he grew up. He might have played games against Benji Marshall. You know, these dudes are all from Aotearoa, Polynesian Māori, and they've all grown up with major connections to Benji Marshall. Ken Mamalo played with Benji Marshall for the Kiwis. So now that whole situation, it's kind of pivoted from, yeah, the Michael M Maguire situation is great because he was Kiwis co coach. He's quite big on um, the Polynesian culture and the kind of brotherhood of that kind of uh, team environment. But obviously his tenure was quite niggly because there's a lot of drama floating around. At least now there's like this fresh hope with the Benji Marshall and just coach, coaching structure there that feels like a better environment for a lot of these Kiwi NRL lads who were recruited by Michael Maguire. Yeah, winner of that game, um, Tigers Knights, winner of that game goes ahead of the Warriors on the table as well, unless the Warriors win now and... Um... Friday night or Saturday night, whenever they play. Saturday, uh, Saturday evening, 5 p.m. 
the Warriors beat the Rabbitohs, and this isn't the case, but if they don't beat the Rabbitohs, which they very well might not do, then the winner, yeah, the Warriors will fall below whoever wins that game. Um, yeah, like, shout out to Ken Mamalo, eh? Because he, he's had a niggly time of it at the Tigers, too. Like, even after the Warriors' departure, um, it's, it's not always been easy for him at the Tigers. So seeing him getting, you know, because I don't, it's a weird one, because I don't know that anyone ever really doubted the ability that he had or what he could bring um just for whatever reason when team when you're playing for bad teams someone's got to get scapegoated now and then and it's generally not just one person your turn's gonna come around um but that yeah tigers are hopefully in a better place now um moving forward so, oh, mastermind tim sheen is going to come in sooner or later and, and solve things and then the great man benji marshall and um quick word as well just for griffin neem as well griffin neem um because i did keep a good i uh, like good eye on him in that um dragons cowboys game he was fantastic and um just yeah he scored the try 130 odd meters just like pushing through the line bending the defensive line don't think he missed a tackle and plays a few more games at a level like that people will learn how to um pr pronounce Niami correctly as well i mean it's, you go <laughs> sooner or later and that that one will um that one will tick over but yeah, it's, he was, I thought, it's the first time I've watched him, like, in a full um, game, like, not just highlights or ducking in and out of a um, of a game, um, and also where he was real prominent as well, so that helps, like, I thought he was, yeah, he was excellent in that game, so just you know, one one more on a, on a long list of um, top Kiwi performers in the NRL each week. And if you're thinking, like, Kiwis, we're talking Brayden hammond Newelle. We're talking Griffin Niami, and they're joining Moses Liotta, Scott Sorensen, who mm. are in the squad uh, and the team that played against Tonga, squad against Tonga. So those are the caliber of forwards. And also, I don't like just the pure center depth. Yes. So the, the yeah. Tigers have Stafford Toa and Asu Kepa Owa. They are the starting centers for the Tigers. They are both from Auckland. Peter Hiku for the Cowboys, Matthew Tomoko for the Raiders, Joey Manu, Dean Mariner, like Morgan Harper, Morgan Harper, not, not a hater, Morgan Harper, he's a lover, not a hater, and he's uh, a trooper. There's a lot of centers, a lot of Kiwi NRL depth and fantastic times for Aotearoa Rugby League. Pick it up to yourself. Tune into all the niche cage content. Email dispatch coming out tomorrow. Big yarns on the website. Tell a friend. Word of mouth. Kia kaha. Raise your mana. Stay beautiful. Cheer cheer.